Good afternoon, folks. We're going to begin the docket, uh, 1, 1 p.m. docket, although it's 1.20, uh, for the July 2nd uh, session of the BMZA. Uh, as everyone knows, we ask that you first please turn off your cell phones, put it on silent. We don't want that to interfere with our recording, either audio or video. Uh, Conversation-wise, if you need to speak with your neighbor or anyone else, please take the conversation out into the hall. Uh, again, so as not to disrupt the proceedings. Uh, we will vote at the end of the day uh, on the matters that are presented to us. Uh, you're welcome around. You're welcome to stick around for the <sighs> civics lesson, uh, if we can present one. Uh, but uh, or you go find some air conditioning elsewhere. But we will uh, render a decision at the end of the day. Uh, otherwise, you can call the zoning office you know, tomorrow uh, to find out how we ruled. You can call 410-396-4301. Uh, your written decisions will be produced probably in about three weeks or so uh, from today. Uh, we ask that you do not build without a permit. Uh, you have to wait until you receive formal written outcome of your case. As I mentioned, that two to three week period, you'll get your ruling. Uh, and you must have that ruling before you can get your permits. Uh, and please do not build in the city without permits. Uh, any opposition to any cases today, if you have not already done so, please sign in. You can do so to my right. You note that a number of folks have done that. Uh, the way this proceeding will go, if you are the appellant, uh, we ask that you come up, state your name. We'll ask you to stand to my left. Uh, the opposition will be to my right. Uh, once everybody's up here, we'll have you all sworn in. Uh, we'll get reports from our planning commission and staff. Uh, and then we will hear your matter. Uh, we will hear from the appellant first, uh, followed by the opposition, and as it happens in court, the appellant will have the last word. Uh, so we, as not to go back and forth and delay the proceedings. Uh, and on that issue, uh, when you do come, and if you're presenting opposition, or frankly, if you have multiple witnesses uh, who are in support of your uh, application, uh, we ask that you be careful about the redundancy issue. Uh, we have heard a lot of these issues, and uh, we get it. Um, so we'd like to get everybody out of here at a reasonable time. Uh, but we certainly want to hear you if you want to be heard. Uh, but we don't want to hear you 10 or 12 or 15 times. Same thing. So please be respectful of that. Uh, we'll call cases as generally as they appear on the docket uh, after we dispense with a few preliminary matters. Uh, one of the matters, uh, you notice that we have three board members present here. Uh, there are certain rules that govern when there are three board members. Mr. Baumgartner. So when the board has only three board members, in order to be approved, you would need the positive vote of all three board members. So that would be um, a unanimous decision. Uh, if any applicant wants to postpone their case uh, for a future docket in which there are more than three board members present, um, the board would most likely grant that postponement request. If there are folks in opposition to a case, uh, our past practice has been that both the applicant and the opposition would have to agree to move forward when there is a board of only three members. Um, so, uh, Mr. Chairman, we'll go through the cases that have opposition, um, and, and again, both sides would have to agree to move forward today. Um, with only three board members present. We will, uh, we expect to have our fourth board member in the next hour or so. Uh, so at that point, um, we would have a board of four in which you would need three out of the four votes uh, to be approved. Um, so the cases that have opposition, and we're gonna skip over 165 for the moment. <coughs> uh, the other cases that have um, opposition are 2019, 183, 2510 Rob Street, Applicant is Yvonne Forrester. Did not answer the call. Did not answer the call. Is there anyone in opposition for 2510 Rob Street? I think they're all out in the hallway as well. Uh, the applicant hasn't responded, so we'll just wait to call that in a little bit. Uh, the next case, uh, there's a set of three cases, uh, 1004 West 38th, 1002 West 38th, and 1006 West 38th Street. Ms. Murdoch is here. Is the applicant here? James Haran. Haran. Good 
Thank you, Ms. Murdoch. So we have opposition signed into this case. We only have three board members, so both the applicant and the board member uh, and the opposition would have um, would have to agree to move forward today. I think we came to an agreement, but please. Okay. Great. Uh, then we'll call your case in turn. Thank you. And then case 188, 2019, 188, 4300 through, through 4312 Seminole Avenue, David Wheelcatch. All right, and the opposition to that case? Yes. All right, do you um, both um, agree to move forward today or, or not? Yes. Okay, uh, hey ma'am, you would like um, a postponement? All right, um, so under past practice, we only have three members. Um, give our office a call tomorrow and we can um, reschedule this case and then we will, um, as long as you've signed in on the sign-in sheet, ma'am, we will notify you when this case will be coming back. All right, you're welcome. And then last but not least, 2019-165-6309 York Road. Half the room stands up. <laughs> All right, um, Ms. Hecker, I believe there's a postponement request. Yes, we've uh, decided that we would like the opportunity to meet with the community, and so we're requesting a two-week postponement. If the board, um, uh, for good cause, can grant a postponement request, uh, given the three-member panel, um, I will leave that to the board's discretion. Uh, no objection, so we'll grant your postponement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this case will be postponed to the board's July something teenth docket. <coughs> Yes. So we requested the postponement due to the uh, pending traffic study in Champaign Walk Avenue. Okay. Um, can you um, um, approach really quick? Thank you. My name's Ian Anson. I'm the Lake Water Community Association okay. President. Um, is this connection with 165? Correct. This is, yes, 165. Uh, is there a current traffic study that's being conducted or requested or what's the? Not to my knowledge. Okay. So the traffic study number is 19-0036152. Okay. So we can postpone the case from today. Um, we don't have any control over traffic studies or over the um, Department um, of Transportation. Um, the board would request that we just get some more information about when that might be conducted. Um, obviously, this has been postponed once before. I um, imagine these plans have been in the works for months and months and months and months. I don't, I would not recommend to the board that we continue and continue and continue. Um, right, we can't agree to an indefinite postponement for sure. the city to conduct a traffic study at some unknown date. Sure. Um, I mean, I would simply request that, that the applicant and the community association just send something in writing to the board with that information, with any kind of contact information that you have through DOT. We can follow up with them just to find out what the progress of that might be. Um, there's no requirement that a traffic study is completed for any project, even though it's a very good idea. Um, but again, the, the, the board is not, um, no interest is served by postponing this um, any further than it's already been postponed. Uh, so if we can get that information within the next week or week or so, uh, and then we can follow up. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would I would request that we go ahead and set it in for the board's next date, and we can certainly postpone from that if the traffic study isn't completed and needs to needs to be completed before the hearing. But um, okay. I, without having a date certain, I sure. I would like to put a date on the books for the hearing, and then we can adjust that as necessary. Sure. Um, did anyone else have to? Are we? Do we have the ability to specifically place it on a certain set date? We're going to plan. We're going to plan that meeting. The board certainly has the authority to schedule cases um, at its discretion. Um, what I wouldn't want to do is postpone it till the next time. Right. One of the things you mentioned was come back and then we'll postpone it again if we if we don't have the traffic study. That right. would be a waste yeah. of time and everybody here again, which we don't want to do. And what I don't know is DOT's schedule for conducting traffic studies. It's very possible that it's eight months, 12 months, 16 months into the future. Um, or it might be next week. I, I honestly have no idea. Right. Um, so that, that would be something that we can reach out to DOT and find no. out. Yeah. Uh, we can commit to do, uh, doing that. We can find out what the DOT schedule is and provide that information to you all because obviously a lot of folks that are involved and want 
to the extent we can get that information and have it ready for you all for use in the, uh, in the hearing, the record, great. We can make that phone call tomorrow. So at least we'll have an understanding by the end of the week, Thursday is a holiday. So we can make the phone call tomorrow, try to get back to folks on Friday at least with a, a definite. It'll either be on July, I'm just forgetting that date. 16th. Yep, 16th. Um, um, or not, but at least by Friday we would have. And if we learn that the traffic study that. won't be completed till six months from now, then we'll all know that as well. Uh, Do you need the traffic study number again? Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you had that traffic study number, I'll make it easier reference. Thank you. A N S O N. All right, and then um, with the board's permission, uh, this case is postponed, and then we will let you all know at, at least by Friday if we will be moving forward on July 16th. All right, wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Do you need that paper? He needs a paperback. No, we were dealing with the postponement. Okay. Now we're going to get that. Correct. I'll put them all in the same. Chairman, we have two folks that signed in uh, in opposition to case 120, which is 2019 120 3715 Yosemite Avenue. Uh, Alicia Williams is the applicant. Yeah. Where did you do the consents? Well, well, we'll 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 do the consents, but we're not going to call. Alicia Williams. We just want to see if they have one have the opportunity to talk. Correct. Uh, right. Correct. Um, there's two folks signed in in, uh, in opposition to 3715. Yosemite yes. Avenue. Yes. Could you identify yourself, please? Where I can't see. Great. Yeah, uh, you can stay there, man. Have you had an opportunity to speak with the applicant regarding your issue of opposition? No. Would you like that opportunity? No. No? You don't think that would be helpful? No. Okay. Very well. Excuse my name. Uh, that's okay, because we'll get it when we call the case formally. Thank you. The other matter, Mr. Baumgartner. The 186. Oh, well, well. Yeah, the 186. Sure. Um, case number 2019-186, 1004 West 38th Street, as well as case numbers 2019-193 and 2019-194, 1002 West 38th Street and 1006 West 38th Street. Uh, Mr. Heron, and any opposition to the petition for Mr. Heron? Yes. Okay. But well, we came to. You you have reached an agreement. Uh, let let me just ask you this: uh, Does the opposition have to do with the density? Any issues regarding density? Not directly, okay. um, but mostly due to the fact that the uh, community has not had an opportunity to sit down um, with the developer and have some conversation over what this looks like. It's three properties that were burned, and um, there are going to be some changes in the back. Um, as to what that looks like, and um, the community wanted just to have some conversation regarding. Okay, and so what is the so we we agreed that if if we do get an approval today, that one of the conditions would be that I get a letter of support from the handing community council community zoning council. and uh, the immediate neighbors. Um, so wait a minute, you're asking for the board's approval, and then after you've been approved, get a letter. You then have to get a letter of consent. Why would you need that if you've been approved? I don't. I, was, I mean, we just that they would make them. They would satisfy their request. I mean, they, they the sign was put up on June fifth, and they contacted me last night saying they had some questions about the plans because the city servers being down. And I said I'm happy to come talk to your community and tell them what's going on. Can your can, excuse me, Stephanie Murdoch, Office of Councilwoman Clark? Yes. Can your approval be conditional upon receipt of a letter from the community? I don't know. Or can that be a condition of your approval that the applicant then meets with the Hand and Community Council's well, land let me use? Let ask you this. Committee? Do you simply want to postpone to meet with the community and come to some agreement so that you don't have these hanging chairs? That was our pr preference, but he. They do, and I don't, just because this was just brought up last night and it's expensive to postpone for us. We brought it up at our community council meeting at um, last Monday, um, and Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark was there, and uh, we 
were asking the zoning board of the community council if they had any information or knowledge or if they had met with the developer because normally that's the way it goes in Hamden and they had no knowledge of it. They had not received notification that this was happening with the server, with the computer issue. Um, and so at that meeting, um, Mary Pat had, uh, Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark had recommended that we reach out with Stephanie Murdoch and make something happen so that we could at least have an opportunity to meet with the developer. So here's the problem with that condition. What if we never get the letter? Mm -hmm. Then we're back here anyway, and I don't, it's the same position for me anyway, so I But we well have to flag the case file and track it and remember it and then come back here in two months and find out if they did meet or they didn't meet and if they proved this well, or I th didn't approve My understanding that. is I would, wouldn't I need that condition when I go to get a permit or no? No. They wouldn't look at the zoning letter and say, where's your letter of support from the council? Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah this is a variance. It's not a conditional use, so if we approve it, then you, you have a right. green light which is what you want, of course. Right. Um, but we're trying to just gauge what the opposition is if there's an issue that yeah. can be resolved. I guess so the, my only issue with, I had no problem meeting with them. My issue is I drove four hours for this today. This sign's been up since June 5th, and I just got an email last night at 6 o'clock saying, hey, we have some questions. So keep in mind that folks have not been sworn in yet. Yeah, right. um, but I just want to get, that, is, there is there substantive opposition to building rear additions onto the existing properties in their existing use as two dwelling units each. I would say the concerns right now are around density and parking, um, blocking uh, access to light and air for surrounding uh, neighbors. Okay. I mean, to me, that sounds like opposition. Okay. So, I mean, it, it's, so we, 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 we went from a place where we were agreeing to everything but you had to I, meet with the community association. There are concerns. So I don't short. know that the concerns are insurmountable, but okay. since we haven't had the opportunity to meet with uh, the developer or he have, he have the opportunity to present his plan to the Hamden Community Council's Land Use and Transportation Committee, uh, we're not aware what other concerns might emanate from that meeting or if this is something that is compatible with what is already uh, taking place on that block. I just don't understand. My response is I don't know how they haven't had the opportunity. We put up a sign on three signs on the same property on June 5th, and no one's ever requested anything till today. Well, they have. The opposition. It's technically the applicant, but because there's three board members, our general practice is that they have to bring the board. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning of the proceedings, because we have three, only three board members today, um, the rule that the, uh, under which the board operates is that uh, both sides must agree to go forward uh, in order to be heard because it must be unanimous consent. I understand you wish to go forward. You, uh, the opposition, certainly want to be heard with regard to the issues and want to get more information. So uh, if it is the opposition that is requesting a postponement, that would have to be honored by the board today. Uh, otherwise, because you obviously aren't in agreement <laughs> to move forward with the information you have. So I think that's what we would like to do. Okay. Uh, and you understand, sir, unfortunately. Yes, yeah, two again, weeks acceptable? Uh, well, we will Correct. to put it in okay. yeah. on the next um, We will reissue the posting notice. Uh, please keep the sign on the property and then change the date. So you can change it with a big old Sharpie. You can, you know, um, I'm not sure how it was posted. Okay. Um, but we'll reissue that posting notice for July 16th. Okay, thank you. Um, and it would be very, very helpful if, if folks can meet ahead of time <laughs> so that we don't have the same thing on the appeal we just heard earlier where we have a continuous postponement and postponement right. and a postponement. Very well. So okay, thank you. formally, uh, let's for the record, uh, case numbers 2019-186, 1004 West 38th Street, case number one. Sorry, 2019 193, 102 West 38th Street, and case number 2019 194, 1006 West 38th Street, all are postponed from today's document. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. At this point, we will move to the consent agenda. Uh, 
Uh, these are cases for which the zoning board and staff has reviewed the files and determined that we have enough information to approve your appeal. We'll call all the consent cases together, um, have you all sworn in, and then take any additional information. If you'd like to have that added to the record, uh, when I call the case on your consent case, if you could line up to my left, uh, and then we'll take your cases in turn. So let's see if we have any left. <laughs> Do we? Three left. Three. Okay, I'm looking at case number 2019-187, 3729 through 3737 Gulf Street, Josh Menti. When I skipped over, uh, anyway, I got no response from the Gulf Street address. We'll call that again. Uh, Mr. Metz, he's right there. He's here. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, uh, if you could line up to this side. And there's one case ahead of you, actually. 2019-184, 2622 Ashland Street, Lee Giroux. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Good afternoon. Sorry to, sorry to overlook that. Uh, what else do we have here? Case number 2019-191, 3208 Labyrinth Road. Donnie and Kiri. And finally, case number 2019-209, 3407 O'Donnell Street. Matt Nuflin. Very good. Swear will affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. First case, 2019-184, 2622 Ashland Street, Leisure Row. This is a request to use as community center and one dwelling unit. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Do we have any staff reports? Yes. Martin <coughs> French for the Baltimore City Planning Department. The Planning Department has reviewed this application and has no objection to its approval. Thank you. Very well. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Rose, anything you'd like to add? No, we're fine with everything. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, the board, having heard your appeal, uh, I believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you. Thank you. It's number 2019-187, 3729 through 3737 Gulf Street, Josh Mente to use first floor as office and second floor as one dwelling unit. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. All right. Do we have any staff reports? Yes, thank you. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that it is for what are at the moment on record two separate lots, which is 3729 to 35 Golf Street, which is one lot, and then for 3737 Golf Street. The proposal for the redevelopment of this property includes placing a parking lot uh, or parking area in the front of the property, which would include the use of the property known as 3737 Golf Street. In order for this parking on 3737, what is now 3737 Golf Street, to be approvable, it must be consolidated with the other lot in order to become accessory to the principal use of the property as offices and a dwelling unit. The Department of Planning therefore recommends approval of the application be subject to the conditions that the lots are consolidated to create a single lot known as 3729 to 3737 Gulf Street and that the parking lot and all landscaping are developed and installed in accordance with requirements of the zoning code and with plans approved by the Department of Planning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, Mr. Mente, having heard those conditions, are those conditions acceptable to you? Yes, they are. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Just like to thank you for your time. All right. Uh, well, the board, having heard your appeal, I believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal subject to the conditions which you've agreed to. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Take care. Uh, case number 2019-191, 3208 Labyrinth Road, uh, Donnie and Curie, to construct second floor addition on the entire house. Is that correct, sir? That is correct. Do we have any staff report? Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Incuri, is there anything you'd like to add to your application? No. All right. Well, the board, having heard your appeal, I believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, finally, 2019-209, uh, 3407 O'Donnell Street. Matt, and I know I'm butchering your last name. Uh, let me stop you there because I'm Alex Kishafi. I'm here at the behest of Matt Knopfel. Okay. Uh, it's... Uh, C A S C I O F F E. And this is a request to construct a one story attached rear garage. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Do we have any staff reports? Planning Department has no comment on this application. Thank you. Okay. And, sir, uh, do you have anything you'd like to add to your? Uh, thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Short and sweet. Uh, you're welcome. Um, uh, the board, having heard your appeal, believe we have sufficient information to approve your appeal. Thank, thank you. you.
Now we will turn back to our okay. Turn back to our regular docket, uh, and we will start with case number 2019-120, 3715 Yosemite Avenue. It's Alicia Williams. And any opposition, uh, could you please come up? This is to use basement and first floor as 35 child daycare center. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And opposition is present? All right. Uh, swear the witnesses, please. Yes. Uh, very good. Do we have any staff reports? Yes, thank you. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is in an R1 zone. This property is also uh, in an area specifically where it is going to be a bit of a challenge to provide safe drop off and pickup for the children who would be uh, taken care of at this center. The property does not have an on-site drop-off zone and unfortunately because of the layout of this particular area there's not a location suitable for drop-off or pickup of children on the site itself. If 35 parents were all to drive to the site at one time it could not likely be done in a safe and orderly manner. This particular location is difficult to adapt for the proposed use as Yosemite Avenue is functionally a two-lane street and visitors' vehicles must park on the verge between the curb and the sidewalk. For this reason, unless the applicant obtains approval to remove a portion of curbing and create a paved pullout area in front of the property, it is unlikely that a passenger loading zone could be created to serve the proposed use. The Department of Planning recommended a deferral of a complete hearing of this application to allow the applicant time to discuss creation of a possible paved pullout area for vehicles in front of this property with the appropriate Baltimore City agencies. Alternatively, the department would have no objection to approval of this application with a reduced capacity of eight children. Thank you. How many children? Eight. Eight. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Williams, uh, we note that this matter was postponed from May 21st of this year and also from June 18th, 2019, uh, most recently to allow you the opportunity to have discussions with MDOT, uh, particularly with regard to the drop-off issue. Um, uh, have you? Were you able to engage in any such discussions and come to any? Yes. Yeah, so per our discussion, we considered dropping our number down from 35 to 25 and using a 15 passenger van to transport the children back and forth um, from a, we'll do a drop off location and have them. I'm sorry, hold on there. Okay. Could you state your names? Oh, I'm sorry. In Kenja Yassine. Sorry, what was that? In Kenja, N-K-E-N-G-E, -E, last name Yassine, Y-A-S-I-N. So we will use the 15 passenger van, a point of a drop off location that won't be in the area. There's plenty of shopping centers and then use the driveway for the 15 passenger van to drop off and pick up. How would that work? So there's um, like they have a, it's a subway station right down the street. We would use that as our appointed drop off location where we pick the children up or even door to door transportation because that's one of the services that we offer. And we would pull in the driveway so there wouldn't be any on street parking for the van or any cars. I get the driveway part, but the, um, would you, would you schedule pickups? Yes, yeah, so um, normal drop off is in between six and eight, I mean six and seven a.m. anyway. Mm -hmm. So yes, we would schedule pickup uh, in addition to the ones that we do that we do door-to-door -door transportation. The majority of our clientele are pickups that we do door-to-door -door transportation with. So, tell them about your other daycare center because you're running into something else. Hmm? We have more than one daycare center. We're doing this right. If you're running and it. then we have another location that we do the same thing. We, use, we, we came before zoning with Busy Bees Early Learning Center and we were able to provide that same transportation feature with that one as well because we have a driveway there as well. Tell me again, the, you mentioned the shopping center. What's, what's the, the relevance of the shopping center? We could use that as a drop-off location as well, in addition to, so that we won't have the traffic on the on-site, on the Yosemite. We could use that drop-off location. There's a subway station very in very close proximity where we could use that to have the parents drop off to us, and there would only be one van traveling to the center. Who would be with these kids before you pick them up? 
What do you mean? With you said the kids are going to be dropped off at a location. You'll pick them up at that location. What, what, what will be the supervision? It's, we'll have, kids? based on the criteria for staffing, we would have to have at least four staff for this. this. No, I'm talking about at the drop-off point. Parents will drop them there. I mean, the parents will hand them off to the right. yes. van oh, okay. at the yes. shopping center? Yes. yes. So how do you manage if there are parents who don't want to participate in the drop-off program and they want to bring their kids and drop them off and pick them up themselves? Well, per, because of this this being an issue with, with zoning, we wouldn't have that as an option. So, But how would you control that? There, there would be parents who <laughs> just want to come and pick up their kids. Or we can them. appoint other locations for them to, to, to drop off other than Yosemite. But we also feel, uh, in addition to the parking situation, the reason that we're really adamant about opening the center in this area is because we want to provide a service to that, that community. Um, I know that the parking is an issue, but we have highly qualified staff that would accommodate the needs of this community. So there's no one in this area that's providing care from 6 a.m. To, um, to 8 p.m. We want to accommodate the needs of the community. Can you show me, I have the application here, mm -hmm. and I have a, uh, I guess a picture of the, the plaque uh, for this location, mm -hmm. but I don't I don't have any idea where the shopping center would be in relation to uh, where. You're talking is. about. Would you know? Kmart, Wabash, yeah. and Wabash. Northern Parkway is right. where the shopping center is. And that's about how far from the location? Uh, maybe five, five minutes. minutes. Yeah. And you are seeking to amend your petition uh, to accommodate this alternative transportation mode from 35 to 25. Yes. Now, does that require two of those trips with the van? Yes. Yes. Hmm. Any questions from the board? I asked one question. No, I asked a question on here. Mr. Baumgartner, are there any other issues that come to mind with regard to this kind of, I guess, alternative suggestion of, uh, I'm not, I must say, I'm not recalling the, the busy bees. I could have been here and heard that, ap that appeal uh, with regard to the transportation mode. Did you have a situation in which uh, there was a problem with a, identifying a drop-off, a suitable drop-off. Yes, originally they told me they, to, um, there's a floor over in the uh, Fayette Street to do a, to go and apply for a drop-off zone, but because we had ample um, off-street parking for the 15-passenger van, it was approved. Okay. But we didn't have the issue with dropping off at a location and bringing them to, we didn't, that wasn't a part of our okay, amendment. But, but a part, part of that situation where which you resolved uh, via drop-off locations with a, a passenger van, there was there was suitable off-street parking on at that location? Is that what you're saying? Yes. And we, would you agree we don't have suitable parking at this location? That's why we want to provide the service with the transportation van. Okay. To accommodate those needs. And you're saying that the customers uh, would not have the option to bring their children to the location. They would have to agree to meet the van at a particular drop-off section. Yes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You said it would be an option? I don't think it should be an option. Oh, we would have okay. to talk about this. Okay. Yeah. Well, then we come back to, uh, because I would imagine you want it to be an option because right. you certainly want, don't want to dissuade folks from coming. Exactly. But then you have the issue of the drop-off mm -hmm. if it's not going to be at, well, at a location. Well, door to door, maybe we'll try door-to-door -door service if parents are not willing to. in addition to door-to-door -door service. That was one of the features, door-to-door -door service. And then w if parents wanted to drop them off physically at the location. Could we do a window for the parents to drop the kids off? I don't know what you mean. Like a time window? Yes. Like between certain hours? Um, well, I mean, we certainly at the location, I, I think yeah. the issue still as presented by planning is the unsuitability of a, of a safe drop-off area at that location. The way to resolve that is to reduce the number of children, uh, at least as planning is recommending, to down to eight.
which I understand is not the intent of the applicant. You would like to have certainly 35, but some number short of that if necessary. Right. Uh, but so did you have the discussion with MDOT, and was there any way that you could move forward and request or, or request what it is that, that would allow a, a paved uh, uh, construction of a, of a, of a drop-off area? I did speak with them, and they said that I would have to talk with the city to see if they could come out and maybe make the paved way or whatever it was that was supposed to be. Have you talked with the city? No. Because there's a space between the sidewalk, mm -hmm. the street and the sidewalk, right? That's I guess it's currently grass mm -hmm. that could potentially be dug up and a passenger loading zone placed there. Would it be an option to do the transportation portion for now and then come back to once we can? Because once we're we talking about finances when you're talking about digging up a hole. We can only go one at a time. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, ma'am. So I was saying, could we move forward with transporting them with a drop-off location and then eventually come back once it's financially um, at a place to be able to put the improvements to create the, the driveway that MDOT suggested? Well, um, once it's approved, it's in approved. theory, but as I hear from your cohort, that's not something you really want to impose on the customers no. at this point. No, I would. Okay. Um, anything else you'd like to add? No. Okay. Let's hear from your opposition. Could you stay, uh, step to the podium and state your names, please? My name is Mrs. Polina Key. My position is that I, um, What's your name now? Valerie Pulley McKee, V-A-L-E-R. McKee is M-C-K-E-E. -E. Um, my statement is in rejection of rezoning for the creation of a day, uh, daycare facility at 3715 Yosemite. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of history here so that you understand why I'm talking about the economics, the tax base, and the school system. Uh, Yosemite, 3715 Yosemite Avenue was sold in 2002 for $82,000. Uh, Zestimate estimate says that it is now worth seventy nine. dollars Point five plus thousand dollars. So you can see that there is a decrease. There's changing going on. We have issues that we have a problem with crime. Crime is less than one block away. If you have a lot of traffic in the area, you're going to have criminals who will be able to mix into the area. No fault of these ladies, but simply because the neighbors now do not know who everyone is. So we are, as a community group, working to, you know, decrease that problem. And this would exacerbate the problem. I also have to go on to say that um, it, how many bathrooms do they have for this number of people? I'm just throwing that question out there, food for thought. Um, on what floor are the bathrooms? Because they are saying that they're going to use the first floor and the basement. So we're thinking that there won't be any travel to the second floor. I'm going to go back to the property values. Property values have dropped and will continue to fall if the community is assaulted by rezoning and crime. And rezoning is going to perpetuate crime. Um, if our homes were picked up and placed in Roland Park or Ten Hills, our homes would be worth over a million dollars or at least would fetch a quarter, uh, three quarters of a million dollars. I've already done the research, looked at the homes in those other areas, and they are exactly like, if not compar to, comparable to, the homes that are in uh, Callaway Garrison and Ashburton. As a matter of a fact, the Baltimore Sun paper said in 2003 that Ten Hills was a country oasis in the city. Ten Hills is not very different from our area. Um, it's only a difference of people. I'm pleading this case emotionally now. The educated offspring group who had children um, grew up, moved away 
to safer neighborhoods and schools, but not to better quality architectural houses. You cannot buy these houses other places because they are being inherited or if they have to be bought back from nursing homes, pe the children are paying the money to buy them back. We want this to continue to promote our community. If we have a rezoning that changes the name, it's no longer residential. It is now business or it is now commercial, residential. Who would buy, would you? I wouldn't. Uh, let me interrupt you for a second. Yes. Uh, Mr. Baumgartner. Yes, sir. Could you remind us of what the, I don't wanna know, I don't wanna say it's standard, but uh, for, for allowing daycare in a particular. Sure, so um, there's a distinction between a daycare center and a daycare home. Um, so a daycare home would be eight or fewer children. I believe that's what the planning department was kind of indicating. Uh, for eight or fewer children, it would be allowed by right. Mm -hmm. So there's no public hearing, there, you simply get a permit, the state of Maryland inspects the property, makes sure it's safe. Um, uh, so there, there'll be no hearing for that. Uh, for a daycare center, which is more than eight children, it would be uh, under the code, it is a conditional use. Uh, conditional uses in this R1 district include daycare homes. Uh, conditional use is a presumed valid use of land. So the city council looked at the entire city of Baltimore and said all R1 properties can have a daycare home as a daycare center as a conditional use, meaning that this is a presumed uh, good use of property, but this board has the authority to put conditions on that use. They can cap the number of children, they can require um, certain hours, uh, there are many, many different conditions that this board has the authority to, to place on that use to mitigate that impact in that community. May yes, I ma ask a question? Sure. Because my retention is minimal. Mm -hmm. um, I heard you mention eight. Eight is Correct. fine. Mm -hmm. But we're not talking eight, are we? Correct. Their original application was 35, and if my understanding is correct, they've, they've, they have amended that down to 25. Yeah, see? Okay. Ma'am, I, I, I will I tell you that I asked Mr. Baumgarten to provide that because the bulk of your presentation has been about home values, which is not, frankly, before us. Okay, the issue of but, the standard that we but have to meet. the reason why I present that is because home values will decrease, and you will not be able to get people to buy next door to a, day, to a child care program. And I think the code has taken that into account, which is why the code says what it says and allows it as a conditional use, assuming certain criteria are met. Yeah, I, I came to resist and hope that the wisdom of the rezoning board would see that if you want more people to buy in that area, thereby creating a tax base and the taxes go to schools, you will see that from the owner's perspective, prospective buyer's point of view, that this is not a wise move. I understand every word that you're saying. Okay, well please understand that we are bound by certain provisions of the code and actually our, our discretion in a way that promotes the code. So we, for any case that comes before us, it is really not up to us to substitute, certainly we can use our common sense and wisdom, but to substitute uh, our you know, beliefs or view as to what might be a better thing to do when the code is written for us to sort of be guided by. Um, so I appreciate that presentation, okay. uh, but I just wanted to make you aware that as a conditional use, there are certain things that we're looking to hear um, for or against uh, to see whether or not that standard has been met. And yeah. therefore we're exercising our discretion based on that. Well, I'm gonna go with what you guys have been talking about. And when you talk about a loading zone and you talk about putting in pads, and I know you don't want to hear from me that um, it's going to affect the cosmetics of the area and thereby change who buys there. Um, but I will show you this. And unfortunately, I did not get my 200 foot tape measure out to measure the street. But 
if you care to look at it. Yes. If you'd like to submit it, we certainly will. Yeah. And what is it you're showing us? Um, what I'm showing you is the street is too small, uh, and, and let me connect the dots. You mentioned something about putting in a pad, spending money and putting in a pad. The street is too small for even putting in a pad. Altering the property by uh, tearing up and pouring crush and run to pour a uh, blacktop for a pad is not good. So this one of the pictures that we have that was not submitted by you shows a couple of cars that are parked and they seem to be parked up on the this grassy area between the street and the Thank sidewalk. Thank you for making that point. So is this the norm in that neighborhood? Yes. Okay. That is the norm. And that is the norm because cars come through so fast they tear off the mirrors of people's vehicles. Okay. And if if the cars are parked on both sides of that street, then only one car can get through? No, no, not, not all the way through the street. When you enter Yosemite from Airedale, yes, a car can get maybe to the bend. Okay. Then if you have other people home that day and on each side of the street, no, a car cannot easily get through, and I am so sorry that one of the key members who reject this idea is not present because of an emergency, because she would tell you that an emergency response vehicle had to back up and drive away and go all the way down, because she, Airedale is not two ways on throughout all of Airedale. Right. So the emergency response vehicle had to go all the way down to Bell to go around, come back up, their loading area had to be the rear, not that side part of the ambulance bus, because there was blockage. Mm -hmm. and, and that's with residents who live there. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Oh, wow. uh, anything else, ma'am? Mm -hmm. Anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, because you don't want to hear it. <laughs> uh, I'm giving you the no, opportunity to speak. I take that back. You can't hear it. I, I want to hear what oh. is relevant to us to decide. So if, if there's something else you'd like to add, I'm happy to hear it. Um, I will tell you that I was born and raised there. I have owned property there for over 60 years. Tell me when to stop. And I really am animate about this. I am committed to this community because I grew up in this community and I know the beauty of the community and I know the class of people who were once in the community who took care. I also know that there are other daycare programs in the community. I don't know what hours they provide and serve to the community, but I can tell you, Garrison is no longer serving kids. Garrison is a holding tank. Garrison Junior High School, Garrison Middle School, Garrison School Facility is now a holding tank for schools that are under construction. So we do not have a large number of children in that area, in the Callaway Garrison, Ashburton area, who are attending the schools. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> Thank you. We'll hear from uh, the additional opposition. And state your name, sir. My name is Donald Wiley. Um, Wiley. I represent the community of um, Yosemite. I have a petition from the community stating against okay. the daycare facility. It's a lot of older people that live in the community who are against the um, that daycare, especially for 35 kids. They're not gonna. They're not gonna question eight kids, but 35 is too many. I have pictures of different times of the day of traffic. I mean, of cars parked. Okay. <clears throat> times, and as you can see, that you know, there's always cars parked there. All right. I also heard y'all say something about the van. Um, any kind of mechanical um, vehicle is almost unreliable. So the day that van break down, what will be the procedure then that they're gonna have pick up in front of the in, that, in front of that house? That's gonna that's gonna provide a nuisance for the community. And the 
community is against it, especially 35 kids. Thank you, sir. Anything else you'd like to add? Well, I noticed, I, I know that the particular builder of that house, I was in the fire department for 29 years. So I've been in most of them, them type of dwellings, <coughs> you know, most of my life. I know the builder of that house. I ain't been in that house specifically. That I can't see that house handling 35 kids. I can't see that house handling with um, laboratory facilities, 35 kids being able to um, take care of 35 kids. The um, family member who lives on that block, I know the size of her house is almost the size of the house they in. No. All right. Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. uh, Ms. Williams? You have the last word. I'm sorry. You have questions. Well, no, um, I just had a follow up for the applicants, uh, similar to the lines of the prior testimony. So, just looking at the the, fir the 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 floor plan for the first floor in the basement, um, as a parent of a daycare aged child, I'm, I'm looking at the space and thinking. Um, so, the basement you have an area that's 23 feet by 23 feet, and then a rear area that's maybe half that size. Um, can you just describe um, you know, how there's space for something like 25 children of varying ages to be in that space? So the requirements are 35 square feet per child. So we based our 35 number using the whole entire space. Um, the before and after children would be eventually, uh, we wanted to get approved for zoning for the maximum amount, but our license initially we were putting in for 15 for the first and second floor and then 10 for the top floor. The application we have says first, in for says the basement floor. and first floor. Oh. That's why I'm a little confused. So the application says basement and first floor okay. with the upper floor remaining, I'm assuming residential, it has bedrooms and all that kind of stuff in there. So you did the measurements. So does that number come down dramatically from 25 if we're just looking at, uh, and I would add that the entire home is 32 feet deep, something like that, right? Just trying to get an idea of, of, of space, right? And how many how many children? Is this the petition or is this? No, this is measurements. Oh, measurements. Mm -hmm. Just for the record, um, I'm sorry, Ms. Middleton. Um, the opposition has handed up a, a document. Uh, I'm just going to note it as a opposition exhibit two. And it's a, a statement with some figures. And you're welcome to look at this if you'd like to. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I'm just trying to get an idea of the, the, the space inside of that it's a very structure Thank you. where we're going to have kids. So the, the total square footage of the property is 1,532 square feet. If, if each child is, um, and if he, even if we did just the first, the first and the basement, that would be at least 1,000 square feet. And what is the age range of the children? Um, from six weeks to 12 years old. So, I mean, are you going to have like a crib room? I mean, typically they three have like infants. ones and twos and threes and three then a toddler room. And three infants. We're only going to do three infants. And then um, um, the rest would be two and above. Can I ask a question? What is your role in connection with the proposed daycare? What role will you occupy? Um, her director. Okay, and she'll be the owner. The owner. Yeah. Yes. And then in reference to the parking again, um, would it be a consideration to use Callaway or Airedale for drop off? It's a it's right at the corner and have the for in the event they address the important concern that mechanical issues. If the van were to default or, or something, could we use Callaway um, as a drop off location or Airedale? Are they depicted on your your application anywhere in the map in the flat description? I mean, because what, what I'd like to see is what it is you're talking about. You understand? 
Who was the Rodale? Rodale. It's Callaway. Go Callaway. Callaway. Yeah. Okay. This is Callaway. And so they have the end of each block. block. Well, what I what I what I perceive is that your application is being constantly amended as we're speaking. Mm -hmm. um, one of the uh, options that you have is to either withdraw this application and resubmit it based on what you understand relief you're not going to be able to get from MDOC uh, with regard to uh, a drop-off location, uh, what that results in in terms of a decrease in the number of children that you're able to utilize with whatever drop-offs or locations that you are seeking um, because if we're going further and further afield from your actual application, which is what it is we're here to, to decide. And to add that, Mr. Uh, to add to that, Mr. Chairman, there's a letter in the file from the that was submitted by the applicant from the State Department um, of Education, which has the approximate capacity of the daycare center to be 10. So is there a reason why this says 10 and not 35 or 25? So the State of Maryland independently licenses child care facilities, and they have authority, as does this board, to cap the number of children. So I'm just wondering why it says 10 here. Sorry. You familiar with this letter? That's what it states. Thank you, Mr. Belmgo. Sure. Um, this is. Have you? Would you like to submit this for the record? Sure. I didn't correct grammar. <laughs> no, that's okay. Oh no no no. But I'm Just certainly. Understand. We're certainly able to consider it if you if you'd like. We to won't judge you. Congested? Yeah. Uh, all right. So you agree this is part of your application, correct? Uh, yes. Is that something you were unaware of? I, I, don't, I don't remember seeing that letter. So if it was in my packet, I must have skipped it. That's the letter that you get after the initial application. Um, I'm not sure why that says 10 because we submitted it with 35 initially. And, and they haven't come out yet, so that, was, that wouldn't have been because of their discretion that they used for deeming the property as only being able to be licensed for 10 because they have to come out and measure themselves, and that has not happened yet. So that would, would have been an error on our part in submitting the application. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Ma'am? No, thank you. Okay. And thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Um, no, in fact, <laughs> it ends with the appellant. Thank you. Yeah. Call the next case of let's see, 2019-163, 3726 Winterbourne Avenue, Jeffrey Pope, to use as two dwelling units. Good afternoon, Mr. Pope. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, is that correct? This is uh, to use as two dwelling units? Yes. Okay. Uh, do you swear the witness? Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing that it is true, false, true, and that the testimony is true? I do. Okay. Do we have any staff reports? Yes. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is in an R3 zoning district. This is a district which does not permit multifamily dwellings, either as a permitted or a conditional use. According to records available to the planning department, the property was last authorized for use as a single family dwelling, which is a permitted use. And the planning department was not able to determine from the records any indication that there was a non-conforming multifamily use of this property. For that reason, the Department of Planning recommends disapproval of the application because non-conforming use of the property as a multifamily dwelling is not lawfully established and the zoning code does not authorize multifamily dwellings in the R3 zoning district where this property is located. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Pope, uh, having heard uh, from planning, uh, can you tell us about your case with particular reference to what evidence you might have of the prior lawful use of this particular property as a multi-unit uh, multi uh, this property has been in my family since 1965. This property was really my mother's house. I see. My mother passed away in 2017. 
So originally there was always a tenant on the first floor. We lived on the on the first floor. As inside your packet, you will see pictures of the BG&E light panel as well as gas panel. So it's been independent. The two separate units have been identified since April the 1st, 1984. So, and I know it's kind of dense. Apologize. <laughs> Could you direct me to where that I might find that? Well, you took it apart. <laughs> <laughs> Had you not taken it apart, it'd been well, all it apart. It's, it's So it was in tab seven. Whereas oh, when it was, oh, you mean when it was submitted, okay. yep, it was tabbed. <laughs> it was using, at, I'm he, using it as a He took it apart. <laughs> See? It was actually color coded and tabbed uh, in individual binders. Yes. Which we certainly appreciate, Mr. Pope. Um, but if, if you can walk us through what you have. Um, so <laughs> basically show you there we go. right I think we found it okay yeah. so there's actually pictures of the separate two separate units for each floor mm -hmm. so the separate bg &E, separate electric for each floor the house does pay does have one water meter the the my mother paid the, the lower tent the pay the water bill for the property additionally in there we also submitted the bg &E bills for the first floor showing that someone was in the house since 2017 no one has lived on the first floor but there is a tenant on the second floor. Additionally submitted, there is a tenant lease agreement. The tenant has been in the property since 2009. Um, we also have, the tenant does pay a BG&E bill, the tenant does pay, have her own separate utilities, but we pay the, uh, the water bill for the tenant. Um, this, we say non-conforming for R3, that district is relatively new based on the new zoning change that went in for the Baltimore City. Additionally, I've sent you submitted pictures in that neighborhood at 3722 is a three unit multiplex. Behind the house is a four unit multiplex. So it's not like the house is something that is a, you know, a pink unicorn that exists in a neighborhood. Additionally, as I've submitted some other notes of other properties that are listed from your city site that are multi-units within inside the neighborhood. And finally, I, there's also a letter in there from the let, from the, uh, the president of the Neighborhood Association approving the change. And also the next door neighbor at 3722. So they've been notified of the, requ of the request and they don't have a problem with the change. Okay, it seems to me the most uh some of the most salient information that you provided in support of the history of the lawful use of multiple units uh, or the meters. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said this has been in effect since? April 1st, 1984. 1984. Okay. Since I meters. Mr. Pope, um, did you grow up um, in this home? Yes, I did. All right. And um, when you were growing up, it was then used as a two dwelling unit structure? Yes. Any questions on the board? Mr. Pope, I think that's, thank you for your presentation. <laughs> thank you, sir. All right. Uh, but is there anything else for that you don't think we have that you'd like to add for the record? Uh, oh, the, the property is properly registered with the city. It has been, it has been for lead paint certification purposes. So everything is in compliance with the city. We, the, the, Everything is dotted I's, crosses T's, just making sure that we're going to do things the right way and not try to just, you know, just like, eh. Mm -hmm. Very well. So. Thank you, sir. Thank uh, you. I'm trying to read my notes to see what the next case is. The next case we brought was from Mr. Reynolds, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe not. No, I'm just going to move around the street. Yeah. Rob. Uh, next case we called is 2019-183, 2510 Rob Street, Yvonne Forster. Good afternoon, Ms. Forster. And this is a request to use the basement as deli, carryout, and convenience store? Yes. Okay. Any opposition? Please come forward.
And just for the record, uh, I just want to confirm, have the parties had an opportunity to speak about their differences and the nature of the opposition prior to today? No. Okay. Would you like an opportunity to do that? No, thank you. Swear the, swear the witnesses. Raise your right hands, please. Everyone raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Do we have any staff reports? Thank you. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property is zoned R6 and is also located in the Coldstream Homestead Montebello Urban Renewal Plan area. The application requests approval of a convenience store, a delicatessen, a restaurant, and a carry-out food shop. To speak first to the last item, this particular use, uh, carry-out food shop, is a prohibited or a non-conforming use in the R6 district. And there is indication in the records that that carry-out food shop use had been discontinued by the time in 2015 that an application to use the uh, portion of the premises as a beauty salon uh, was filed in 2015, which would indicate that at least 12 consecutive months have passed during which the non-conforming use has not been in operation, and therefore under the terms of the zoning code, that non-conforming use is not something that can be revived or approved a second time. With regard to the remainder of the application, the property itself would physically qualify for neighborhood commercial establishment. Uh, which is a conditional use in the R6 zoning district. However, this property being located in the Coldstream Homestead Montebello urban renewal area is covered by an urban renewal plan which specifically prohibits neighborhood commercial establishment uses, uh, specifically the land use plan component of that urban renewal plan, section B112. The department therefore recommends disapproval of the application because the proposed use is prohibited by the Coldstream Homestead Montebello Urban Renewal Plan for the area in which the property is located, and because a carryout food shop is prohibited use in the R6 zoning district where this property is located. Thank you. Ms. Forster. Yes. Uh, having heard uh, the planning department's review, uh, would you like to tell us about your project? Um, yes, I purchased this building back in 2005. I actually... That was our 2005, ma'am? Um, yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I ran the store for a couple of years. Um, what store? 2510 Rive Street, the deli. We called it Briscoe's Deli. And um, the community seemed to be very open to it, happy, everyone enjoyed my cooking. Um, after that, I began to rent it out because I had other things going on. Being a landlord, it pretty much became like a full-time job for me. So I did rent it out. Um, the people that ran it, um, they never had um, people hanging out in there like some places I have seen. I still live in Baltimore City, so I know some of these stores aren't what you would want in your neighborhood. Um, what years um, was the property rented out as a deli? Um, I like to say from 2007. Um, this last past until year. Mm -hmm. Until when? Um, up until now. Um, the lady, it's a, um, Clifford Green has rented the building for like a year. For some reason, he didn't open up. I did tell him he needed to go ahead and open it up. He, you know, pretty much was just painting and he had a daytime job so he didn't follow the guidelines that I told him to do. And so, so if I were to go there right now, I wouldn't be able to walk in the door and order things. Is that correct? Like it's closed, like I couldn't go there and buy things. Actually, it has shelf fillers in there, but yes. Okay. He's been sick for, um, a couple weeks with something going on with him. Well, put aside the couple of weeks, has the store been operating where people no. could do, okay. No. And how long has it not been operating? Well, I've rented it to him for roughly about a year. A, re a year from about now? About a year to now. So at least it's been 12, 12 months that it has not been operating. You would agree to that, right? I would okay. agree. When was the last time you went to that property? 
Well, I drive through periodically um, just to check the alley or see what's going on. Um, but um, I think bg e maybe about six months ago or something, I had to go over there for something for them to check with gas or something. Okay. okay. <coughs> Anything else you'd like to add? Um, I'd just like to say that um, I did speak to a Mark Washington. I'm not sure if he's here today. Um, and I understood the position that they had, but like I explained to him, um, I spent a lot of money in the building. Um, the neighborhood chooses to put furniture and, you know, all kinds of stuff out there. Sometimes people do an illegal dump, but I have tried to do the best I can, but mostly I believe it's the community rather than call the 311, they put the stuff out there, so it did create a problem with rodents. Um, so I spent a lot of money um, trying to secure the building, um, spent a lot of money in equipment, and even though the board or, you know, they had plans, I had plans to, for my um, investment. And um, this time, if you all would grant me the opportunity, because um, I think he made a suggestion that I turn it back into a residential and that he would help me find someone to purchase it. Um, well, that's not a part of my plan. Um, well, you understand that there is an existing urban renewal plan with regard to the community in which you have a property, correct? Correct. And do you agree that you're subject to that urban renewal plan as a property owner within that district? I mean, you know, I, yes, it's going to affect me, yes. Okay. And the various prohibitions that Mr. French discussed, you acknowledge, I mean, you understand that they impact you, and that's why we're asking you time frames, all right? You understand that? Okay. Is there anything else you'd like to add? I'm sorry. Uh, Ms. Forrester, there's a, there was a, um, a use permit that Mr. French had referenced that was issued in 2015 to use a portion of the premises uh, as a beauty salon. Uh, was that ever operated as a beauty salon? Uh, looks like the permit was issued on February 25th, 2015. Well, I, I believe, not um, vividly, but I vaguely remember a lady did um, get the building and run a, a hairdresser or something there for, for some time. It wasn't a long time. But okay. Um, you own the building then? Yes. You don't know if you had a tenant or not? Well, it was a few years back with the back end portion. And this, um, I think it's a waste just having it sitting there, but the zoning, um, you know, didn't allow nothing else to go there. People wanted to rent it, but. Um. So subsequent to the beauty salon, was it then that you rented to the gentleman who, some, for whatever reason, one reason or another, has not opened a business? Yeah, prior to him, it was a, a woman, Miss Josephine. She passed away. She had cancer. And then... Um, Okay, speak to me. Excuse me. Um, yeah, it was a lady there that ran the store, and um, I know people liked it because when I would go through there, like in the summer months, it would be kids getting the snowballs and stuff like that. So she ran the store, and she was doing okay. She ran it until she passed away? Yes. When did she pass away? How long ago? Maybe like two and a half years ago. Then her, her uh, nephew tried to... It didn't work out for me. So That's when I rented it to. Nothing's been operating since she passed away. Um, well, I rented it out to the man, and he was supposed to go and. Well, my, my question is, you rented it out, and he was supposed to do certain things. He didn't do them, right? That's correct. So it has not been operated since Josephine ran her operation, correct? Two and a half years ago. Maybe not quite two and a half, because I don't think it's set. Um, okay. All right, is there anything else I would like have to, to look at their obituary and all of that to give you exact. I don't think that's necessary. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Well, I, that building, um, and along with the um, bar up the street, I purchased from Mr. Hill, Shirley, and William Hill. And um, I think the bar has closed down since then, and I promised those 
people at the time that I would keep the building, you know, keep it up and running. I will be more active with whoever, um, if I choose to run it out or maybe pass it over to a family member, if, you know, the board allows me uh, the opportunity. Um, I just don't wanna lose my investment. And I think um, it cost me thousands of dollars, but it's gonna cost a lot more and what someone really want to invest to take all of that equipment out and turn it back into a home pay the price that i would need and then to change it over in that location okay anything else you'd like to add um, or submit not at this time other than my original paperwork um, when i first got the building if you <coughs> want to look at that no that that wouldn't help the analysis we are asked to undertake um, thank you uh, give me one second um, I don't think we need to hear from anybody else mm -mm. Ms. Murdoch, could you? Yes. Good afternoon. Stephanie Murdoch here from the Office of Councilwoman Mary Pat Clark. I apologize that she could not be here today, but she asked me to represent her. And I'm also joined by a number of near neighbors and Mr. Washington of the Neighborhood Community Corporation. Ms. Murdoch, if, if before you get started, yes, uh, based on what it is we've heard, we think we have a pretty good understanding of what's at play here and what our, our uh, tasks are. Um, but Mr. Baumgartner is going to just confirm a couple of things with you uh, on behalf of the opposition, and I think uh, that'll help streamline this process. Um, so, Ms. Murdoch, uh, this property is located within the, I always mess up the name, Coldstream Homestead, Homestead Montebello, Montebello um, Urban Renewal Plan District, is that correct? Yes. And that urban renewal plan was amended sometime late last year to prohibit neighborhood commercial establishments, um, that is, is that correct? correct. Um, there's a note from the the rather confusing permit history for this mm -hmm. property uh, that places a hold on use and occupancy permits dated September 28, 2017, um, about the use of this property. Um, I, from what from, from my understanding about the opposition to this case. Uh, is that the property is no longer legally being operated as a neighborhood commercial establishment of any variety. It's not being currently operated as a deli or a grocery store. Its doors have been shut, they're closed, I can't go buy anything from there. Um, is it your understanding um, that uh, that property has been in that state for at least the last 12 months? That is my understanding. Okay. Do you have any dates for the board as to when this property was last lawfully used for any type of business yes, activity. Yes, uh, in your packet, the, the binders that were distributed earlier, okay, the second that. document that, that you will find after the councilwoman's letter is from uh, Kathy Burns and okay. it, uh, of, of Housing and Community Development um, discussing the past history of, of uses of this property and uh, I believe it clearly shows that it has not been used um, in a number of years and even attempts to establish a use were later abandoned before the applicant went through the entire process. All right. Just for the record, uh, Mr. Baumgartner, a uh, portion of that information from Ms. Byrne, uh, who's the Assistant Commissioner for Litigation and SIU with the Baltimore City Department of Housing and Community Development indicates that uh, uh, on, and I'm not going to read it all, but go back at least far enough, on two February 25th, 2015, mm -hmm. a use permit was denied to open a beauty salon. Uh, that application was sent to the BMZA, but the BMZA dismissed the appeal on May 25th, 2015. It does not appear to, don't think there was ever a hearing. On uh, September 28th, 2017, another use permit came and the applicant was told they needed to go to the BMZA, but that never happened. Uh, and now it references the particular permit for the location, uh, I believe the instant 
so at least going back to 2015, there has not been wealth or use to the peers. But, um, frankly, uh, Ms. Murdoch, I know we have a number of folks here. Um, any information that you would add, I think, would be superfluous to what it is we think we can already or must do. Our discretion is somewhat limited based on the uh, confirmations that you just made to Mr. Baumgartner. So if okay. there's anything else particularly that you'd like us to consider or add, I think we have sufficient information uh, to decide the appeal. That, that's okay with, with me. It seems pretty open and shut. Is that okay with the community? Very well. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. you all have a good 4th of you. July. All right. You too. Have a safe one. Let me do my chicken scratch here. Calling the case 2019-190, 1900 South Charles Street, Carolyn Hecker. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair Chairman, members of the board. Adam Baker with Rosenberg, Martin Greenberg with offices in Baltimore at 25 South Charles Street on behalf of the appellant. Good afternoon, Mr. Baker. This is a request to raise the existing building and construct five-story mini warehouse 800 storage units with seven off-street parking spaces and 53 square feet, double face, seven and a half feet high, freestanding sign. Is that correct? Uh, yes, with one one correction, it's it's five off-street parking spaces with four loading spaces. Okay, all right. But otherwise, uh, correct. Very well. Could we have uh, witnesses sworn? Raise your hand. Swear or affirm the testimony of Mr. Jerry Hoagie, Carolyn Hoagie, and Mr. Kevin Hoagie. I do. Okay. Okay. Do we have any staff reports? Oh, I have one letter, other than planning. They write uh, from the South Baltimore Neighborhood Association. They write that the representatives of the development team presented their plan to the association membership to obtain our feedback, and we were happy to see that they were willingly modifying their plan to address our concerns on the building's design. Accordingly, the association's members have voted to support the project we understand that the project will require zoning board approval of a parking variance and fully support granting the request. Planning star. Thank you. Planning department received this application and reviewed it. Uh, <clears throat> in this particular zoning district, this property's use as a mini warehouse is a permitted use. <coughs> the only issues as indicated earlier uh, include off street parking the planning department is aware of the fact that this being a mini storage facility doesn't have after the initial loading of all the units uh, a great likelihood that all of those unit owners or renters would appear at any one given time to try to retrieve or place things in their storage units the application indicates that there would be seven off-street parking parking spaces on site including a handicapped parking space with five additional spaces provided off-site the planning department notes that the board may grant a variance of parking based upon unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty and if the existing building's footprint is to be used as the basis for the new structure that would replace it that footprint does not allow creation of more off-street parking spaces on the lot the planning department also wishes to note that the concept plan attached to the application shows what is described as a monument sign uh, measuring approximately seven feet five inches tall with a sign face approximately ten feet two inches wide by five feet one inch high to be erected at the corner of Charles and Wells streets at approximately 30 degree angle from the north-south axis represented by Charles Street according to table 17-201 of the zoning code a freestanding monument sign in the I-1 zoning district where this property is located is limited to a height of six feet and a maximum sign face of 50 square feet Variance of the height limit by 23.6% and of the sign or sign face area limit by three-tenths of a percent would be required also for approval of this freestanding monument sign. This uh, revised site plan dated May 8th of 2019 for this redevelopment was reviewed and approved with comments by the site plan review committee on May 15th of 2019. Final approval is pending submission of amended site plans. 
the review of the proposed building addition and refacing will be made separately by the Urban Design and Architecture Advisory Panel uh, within the Planning Department. The Department therefore recommends approval of this application be subject to the condition that all improvements, additions, and landscaping are completed in accordance with plans approved by the Department of Planning. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Bill Stubbs Project. You bet. And just for the record, uh, to my left, I have my colleague Caroline Hacker from my office and um, Scott Cooper and uh, Spencer Seep with the developer and then standing between them is David Taylor, our site engineer. And just to kind of aid your review, I've got uh, a packet that I can hand out. Memorandum detailing Thank you. the existing conditions, proposed improvements, mm -hmm. requested relief, and the um, legal requirements are uh, the same. Um, and I, if it's helpful, I'll, I'll just quickly go through that, give you some background on the site. Right now, the property is located at the southwest corner of East Wells Street and uh, South Charles Street in South Baltimore, directly across East Wells from the uh, Paps Castle. Um, bordered on the south by uh, there's an existing rail line and I-95 entrance ramp and then directly across Charles Street to the west is uh, a new 193 uh, unit apartment complex. Um, on the property right now are two single story warehouses uh, owned by Pratt Thompson and Company. They manufacture pipe fittings, valves and kind of similar type products there. Um, I mentioned it's opposite the, uh, the apartment complex on South Charles Street. Uh, there was a case before this board in 2012 uh, where the developer of the apartment complex had requested conditional use approval to place a temporary office trailer at 1900 South Charles Street, which was approved by the board. I've got a copy of the order in the packet I just handed to you. Um, proposed improvements. Um, my client proposes a 820-unit, uh, five-story self-storage facility uh, permitted as a warehouse in the I-1. Uh, the relief that we're requesting today is for a parking variance. Uh, we're required to park uh, one space for every 50 units. There's 820, which leaves us with 16 spaces. Um, right now, uh, the proposal shows uh, five parking spaces and four loading spaces. The intent is that the four loading spaces would be used primarily for, I guess, uh, longer uh, unloading loading periods. If someone's renting a unit and they're moving everything in there, they're going to be using those loading spaces, whereas the five parking spaces that are going to be on South Charles Street really are for, you know, intermittent stops. If you have to stop and, and drop something off or pick something up, um, you can use those spaces. Uh, in our experience, we believe that's going to be more than adequate parking on site. We're also getting rid of, uh, there's a curb cut on South Charles that they're using right now for the warehousing facility uh, for loading, unloading. We're getting rid of that, which we think is going to free up two additional on-street parking spaces. Um, there's going to be an accessory office on the first floor of the development. Um, proposed office hours Monday through Saturday, 9.30 to 5.30. No office hours on Sunday. Um, if you rent a unit in the, uh, in the facility, you can have access to it any day of the week up to 10 p.m., so there is some access there. Um, and as was read into the record, we've met with the South Baltimore Neighborhood Association. They're supportive of the project. Um, and I, I'm happy to walk through the, the legal standards, but again, I, th I think they're detailed in sufficient uh, detail in the memo, and I think it stands uh, for itself. But I'm happy to answer any questions the board may have. Just very, very briefly, um, you had mentioned that there were 820 units. All right, so we had 800, and then there was another reference to a 700 and something number, but the number is, is 820? 820. 820. Just so we have that correct. Yes. In notes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, and the revised site plan that Mr. French had mentioned, is that prepared already? Is that um, in this submittal, or is that being prepared right now? It is in this submittal, and, and the revision. Um, this is the one that's approved by the Site Plan Review Committee. I just want to make sure that that follows yeah, any that. potential approval. Oh, there we go.
Okay, um, I don't believe it is. I just want to make sure that if, if that site plan reflects things like footprint issues, that there's not going to be a change so that – got it. Uh, and then last but not least, um, I can't quite tell from the sign-in sheet if someone signed in for this yes. appeal with conditions, but there's a reference to a Ms. Hartel. Ann Hartel. Yes. Spoke to her earlier. She okay. had um, – her, her concerns had to do with that intersection – Evidently, there's a lot of foot traffic, a lot of scooters, people walking dogs, and she was concerned that it should be, uh, you know, four stop signs on that intersection. We're happy to talk with the city about it, but again, it's, it's kind of out of our control. Okay. But um, I, we did speak to her. I gave her a copy of the plan and my contact information as well. Okay. Um, and is Ms. Hartel um, no longer in the room? I think she left. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Anything else you'd like to add? I think we're good. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, calling the case of 2019 192, 744 Dolphin Street, Austin Carroll. Afternoon. Good afternoon. Mr. It's Carroll? It's important to note that I'm Austin's business partner. My name is Will Bowman. Okay, Mr. We co-own the business together. Uh, and this is a request to use as three dwelling units? Yes. Okay. And is there opposition present? Yeah. Okay. All right. Could you swear the parties, uh, sir? Just raise your right hand, please. If you swear or affirm the testimony that you're about to give in this hearing, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Okay. Do we have any yeah, staff? Have any I'm sorry. He couldn't see you raising your hand, ma'am. Do you agree to swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes? Okay. Very well. Any staff reports? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Planning Department reviewed this application, noted that this property was last authorized for multifamily dwelling use of three dwelling units. However, there appears to have been an extended vacancy from 2012 onward which may have caused a reduction in the number of permitted dwelling units to two. And the department notes the specific language of section 18-412B of the zoning code, which states whenever the active and continuous use of a dwelling unit in a non-conforming multifamily structure subject to this section has been discontinued for 12 consecutive months, the discontinuance constitutes an abandonment of the dwelling unit regardless of any reservation of an intent to resume active use or to reoccupy the unit or otherwise not abandon it and the number of dwelling units allowed to continue in the structure is reduced by one. The department also notes that this particular property has a lot area of 1,400 square feet. For three dwelling units, there would be a requirement to have 1,875 square feet. For two dwelling units, there would be a requirement to have 1,500 square feet, which is more than the existing lot area. Therefore, uh, whether it's two units or three, there would have to be a lot area variance approved by the board. The department is recommending disapproval of this application for three dwelling units because the amount of lot area variance required for approval is excessive given the fact that even two dwelling unit use of this property would require a variance of lot area standards. The department would have no objection to approval of a multifamily dwelling containing two dwelling units in accordance with the provisions of section 18-412B of the zoning code. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Sorry, your last name again? Is Bowman. Mr. Bowman? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, can you tell us about your project, bearing in mind the uh, commentary from Mr. French from Planning? Sure. So the uh, we purchased this property in February of 2018. Uh, we purchased it from a local auction company. Our deed recorded with the city on the 20th of 2018. Uh, part of our due diligence when entering any new small residential project is certainly calling zoning and verifying the dwelling count and that the zoning is what we think it's going to be before entering, it, entering into the project. At the time of calling zoning, uh, when we purchased this property, we were told it was for three dwelling units. Uh, and our documentation here shows that that vacant notice didn't hit the property till March 8th, 2018. So 18 days after buying this is when uh, our zoning flipped due to the, the vacant notice being applied. Had we known that this was two units from the beginning and called zoning and that was what we heard, we wouldn't have entered this project. I, I don't never intended to be in front of you today uh, to ask for this variance, so we thought we were doing our due diligence as deeply as we could. 
When you say um, you called the city and you were told, what indicia or what evidence did you get that this was a three unit? Oh, we received, you know, from the person that answers the phone when you call zoning, we ask, could you verify the zoning of this property for us? They said, yes, it's, it's authorized for three dwelling units. I also have uh, printed out here, if it's helpful. Sure. It shows the day our, excuse me, it shows the day our deed recorded, as well as at the time uh, that there was no vacant notice and that the dwelling unit count was for three. So it's also written confirmation. I've certainly learned from, from this experience now that uh, there's a few other questions that should be asked, one of which is, uh, this property's vacant. Is it subject to a vacant notice and when will that be applied to the property? Uh, okay, and if a vacant notice is going to be applied, what would the new zoning be, if anything? Uh, that's been a lesson learned and, and did not know that at the time. Uh, since then, we have renovated the property under the assumption that it's three units. That's how it was set up when we were looking at it. It's three one bed, one bath units. We've done full renovations, uh, including granite countertops, high-end cabinetry, stainless steel appliances, trying to do a really quality rehab job here. Um, there's three water heaters, three meters, you know, the standard setup for three units. Uh, our, our business has, has spoken with myself and my partner Austin have spoken with uh, the community at the community council meeting in June. I've also had the opportunity to speak personally with Ms. Jules here. Uh, we've heard their concerns and I, I wouldn't say we're in disagreement, but we're also not in agreement just over the fact of they do have a community master plan that they need to adhere and set a precedent for and unfortunately I can't offer a solution to that. Um, However, we do have this property currently under contract to be sold uh, to an owner occupant, which I know was a, a concern and a, something that the community valued as well. And so we took that into consideration when evaluating offers. Uh, this contract is appraised and approved uh, and ready to go once zoning is approved. Uh, obviously, if it were to be brought down to two units, we're gonna have to drop this contract. Uh, and, and not to give the pity story, I take full responsibility for what I do with my business, but should we be reduced in zoning and not be able to sell this property, our next action is to be foreclosed on from our uh, short-term lender, which is okay, I accept that responsibility. Um, but I would hate to see a brand new, renovated, fresh uh, property that we've tried to do all the right things on, fall into foreclosure, and then who knows what after that. Um, so that's our outcome here. If we were to try and turn this back into two units, frankly, we don't have the money available for this project. We scoped this out and funded the project accordingly uh, for three units. That's thought, what we thought we were getting into. Uh, we would have to rerun plumbing in two units and cut a large amount of holes in drywall to accomplish this. Uh, we'd have to rerun electrical in two units. We'd have to remove um, a couple meters from bg &E. We would need to eliminate one kitchen that's brand new and, and has great looking granite countertops and new cabinetry. Uh, we would likely need to change the flooring in a few rooms, rip up brand new tile flooring or uh, laminate wood look flooring. Uh, we'd need to devo demolish some walls in one of the entry doors to the unit in the co common hallway. Um, and we, we just don't have the, the finances to do that. So that's essentially uh, our case. Uh, we did not intend to be here to ask, oh, let's buy this property and get it rezoned. That sounds like a great idea. We thought we were buying and renovating a three unit property and we're going to use and sell it as such. Um, from our due diligence that we knew at the time, uh, we, were, we were entering into that. We've now learned a few lessons in the process and, and certainly we'll apply those in the future, um, but are here just to ask for the variance approval to continue this use and to be able to let this sale go through to a responsible uh, owner occupant homeowner who will be living in one of the units. Okay. Thank, Thank you, sir. Did you install the three meters or were they there when you purchased? There was, uh, we had to have bg &E, so this was cut off from the electric service for being vacant so long, so we had to go through the new business application process to have the meters installed. There may have been one or two already there, but I don't remember. Okay. All right. Yeah? Excuse me. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jules Dunham Howie, and I'm representing the Upton Planning Committee. Uh, the Upton Planning Committee is the umbrella organization of the seven neighborhoods in Upton, and uh, this particular property is within that catchment. Um, the 700 block of Dolphin Street has been prioritized within the Upton community for revitalization and redevelopment, and we currently have 10 houses in the pipeline 
uh, on that in that block uh, for redevelopment for home ownership, and we've received core resources from the state to support that. Today we're here because, and we find that this is a sad situation, quite frankly, because we have a developer that's come into the community, invested resources in the community, and now they're in a quandary. But from the side of the community, uh, the use that they have put forth for three units doesn't fall in line with our adopted master plan, which was adopted on August 18th of 2018 by the planning department. And our master plan, which is online, and you all can view it, but here's a um, nice synthesis of it, it clearly states that really our priority within the community is home ownership. Because when you look at the density throughout the Upton community, we have less than 25% home ownership throughout our neighborhood. And so in order to be able to stabilize our community and grow our community, we understand that we have to have a priority emphasis on home ownership. So particularly on that block, the 700 block, we have a con Construct that we're working in place is called the Dolphin Duplexes, where they're re renovating the homes and they're doing the top three floors as a homeowner occupied um, dwelling and then doing a basement or a terrace level apartment. So that would allow for income generation while at the same time having a main homeowner in the community. So we're looking at how we can be creative with allowing for an opportunity for. Um, uh, you know, um, rental units while at the same time supporting our ultimate goal of home ownership. Also, in this particular case, we're very concerned because the variance would have to be a dual variance because, as um, has been indicated by planning, the this, this space doesn't even allow for a two dwelling variance, which is what it currently was. And we said we would be supportive of two units in this particular building. But they're now asking for three, and they don't have the space at all for that. And so we're very concerned because just by the code, it doesn't it doesn't meet the test. So, um, and well, there's a, tr a true issue in that particular block with uh, parking. And the reason being because we have two, um, uh, I don't even know if they're, they're not legally zoned, but we actually have two, um, what do you call them? Rooming houses in that block. <laughs> and so we actually have a high density of people and vehicles that is already causing a challenge. Well, you said that the, th the 3DUs doesn't meet the test. Um, what do you mean by that? I'm just saying according to the code and what was read in the letter, for three units you have to have a certain level of square footage Correct. and it doesn't meet that particular level of square footage. It also doesn't meet the level of square footage for two units. Uh, but the community was willing to accept a two unit usage as long as one of the two units was homeowner occupied. And that's what we spoke with them about. Um, and again, as they have shared their hardship with that they've already gone through their development and that that would be a challenge for them. Thank you. Thank you. You spoke, you spoke with them before they started the project? No, not at all. We did not speak with them until the project was underway, and they just came last month to the community meeting and presented their case and said they had done this for three units. And at that time, we were quite transparent, <laughs> saying, well, we can't support that. <laughs> and, you know. Step to the mic, sir. <coughs> State your name. My name is John Gaskill. I'm the president of the Dolphin Pool Association. Association, and she mentioned the Upton. Upton have nothing to do with it. Upton stops at Pennsylvania and North. We've been building our community for 20 years, for 20 years. I've been the president for 19 years in the community. Upton have nothing to do with us. We have our own development corporation. Otherwise, look here. If people run through this, they run through, they don't tell us nothing. We've been association for about 20 years. And uh, when this guy came down, to do it. That was the worst house in there. It was a drug house. A, a, a lady got killed there. The foot pit bulls there. We got them out of the community. We, we got them out of the community. We said that house would never be an um, apartment house again. The house, a couple of doors from it, which we sold to the um, African lady. She snuck in there and put apartments in there, three apartments. We brought her back to the, brought back down here and had the house put back to single family uh, uh, house. Uh, a dwelling house. Right now in the community, we had one of the safest communities. Every money come out there. We do our own development. We have our own funds for the do our community. We act for no grant or nothing. We and um, we um, uh, 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 um, got our own contractors to build our own community. That was one of the worst drug areas. 
in Baltimore City, what they call the Four Corners. Otherwise, we come through there, got with every drug dealer down there, and told them, look, we're going to get you jobs. We created jobs, made that one of the safest communities in Baltimore City. We had our own police way station there, some of the best polices in Baltimore City. We had come and work with us to get the community right. Even the police commissioner, Ham, used to come down and say, y'all need to um, teach every community how to work like this. Upton community, which, uh, when they're set up, I mean, when they set up their organization for the planning committee, otherwise, called us, the, uh, um, they talked to us. We said, we're doing our own building here. We got nothing to do with y'all. Then we don't know who rained downtown and tried to change this here, but Upton is not part of the community. We got the Holland Blouse Association, we got the uh, uh, Dock and Pool Association, we got our own development corporation, we got different organizations there. She come in here and say, well, what we're doing in here, y'all not doing nothing here. This is our community, we put money. Well, let me Otherwise, ask you, sir, yes, sir. Are you opposing the applicants? Uh, yeah, Hell, what he did, okay, the guy, that came in, I asked him, what you doing to this house here? Oh, well, I'm gonna put a house back here, right? He told me, it was an African American guy, told me, I'm the owner. So he came to my office, my office right across the street, our association house right across the street. He came over and said, no, well, I'm doing this here, I'm gonna put a single family drilling. We got more builders down the building now, right? They come, what are you doing here? We putting single family drillings here, right? Cause I said, we don't want no more apartments in, up in here cause we don't have too much problems and we don't have the parking space. We got 52, 55 pieces of property there. And what we got here going now, I'm trying to get them out there now. They're putting, I call them flop houses. Um, six uh, houses, single family drilling, got six rooms they're renting. It's renting through the community. Now what I'm looking at, we had this place drug free, pure drug free. You see where they them cut the screams when they come by at night and stick drugs out the window. You know what I mean? So otherwise, we want to see a clear. We made this so safe. Upland had nothing to do with us. Nothing. Didn't come down and put a hand with nothing. Only one came and helped us was Clarence Mitchell. That was okay. the only one. Let me, let me focus you here. Yes. So regardless of whether Upton is a part of you or you're a part of Upton, the issue here is right. the applicant's request for three dwelling units. No, 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 because it told me a lie. Otherwise, I'd never want to know more apartments is coming into this community. Otherwise, we would, hey, what been there for, been rentable for quite a few times. That's okay, but what been shut down for years? No, we don't want you back up in here. No, we don't want you back because we don't have too many problems that come up there, hey, with them apartments, uh, homicides, the other one rent the place, they just snuck um, uh, a drug rehab up in there. Before I know they got to it, Two had OD died up in there. They snuck out at night and got out of there before I could get hold to them. You understand me? So this here, no. It cannot be single family drones we, we putting back in our community. Hey, we got our own development corporation. We licensed by the state. We got our bank money. We asked for no grants for nothing, which we built a community. Believe me, if we put our life on the line when the drug dealers come up, coming down there killing us, where was up with we had to get the drug deal, the white t-shirt boys, we put them to work. We got them to help build a community, you understand me? Everybody running down there, cause they wanted to say, every penny of the money been put in that community, we put in there. And they ain't coming down there talking about what they're gonna do nothing. But we gonna put here nothing. For 20 years, I done put my life on the line. Okay. You understand me? Well, but our deal- I understand for this yes, proceeding, sir. you are not adverse to Upton, because Upton is standing with you. Oh to oppose the Right, well condition. otherwise, I'm gonna like, so okay, okay, I understand, but otherwise, but if he came right across, he seen my office right across the street. Okay. If he came to my office and tell me what, it, I would tell him no. You cannot put that there, a single felon, uh, 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 how come we don't want no more apartments here. It's been a homicide, they killed a woman up in there. They're fighting pit bulls up in there, right? We want the stuff out of the community. The other house down the street, they snuck a, a, a drug rehab up in there at night. And then two OD'd up in there. Before I could get to it, they got the mattress and got out of there. Sorry, you understand? Sorry, I think I yes. can speak for the whole board when I say I think we understand what your position is. Yes, and yes, I yes. I so do. You're opposed to it, uh, and that's hey, been a huge problem. We don't want no more apartments into this community. Only oh, single family yeah. drillings, right? Exactly. We Thank building, you, we sir. own. Okay, we own property up there. We build. We got our own development corporation. Sir, sir I heard that. I had that we asked the that. state for no money and nothing. Uh, we got our own money to build our community. Thank you. And Upland got nothing to do with this. Very well. Okay. No, That's you clear. cannot put it there. We don't want it there. Let's go. Okay. Come on, ma'am. State your name, Good please. Good afternoon. Uh, Mr. John has said it all. Uh, we came to this your name. community. Your name? 
Juanita sí. Boyd, B-O-Y-D. Mm -hmm. We came to this community 20 years ago. We created an organization. We started with the team. Together, everyone achieved more. Under that umbrella, we uh, created an association called the Dolphin Pool Association oh, and the Harlem Boston Association. Mm -hmm. Now, what Mr. John is saying as the president of the Dolphin Pool Association oh, is yeah. that we must have a safe community. Understood. We do not want to turn the 700 block of Dolphin Street into all rental property. We need homeowners, residential property, so we can continue to serve the community so they can be safe. Um, it's so much that needs to be done within this community and creating rental properties, bringing in drugs, more people. We have problem with parking. You have a church there. They use the block for parking. So there's a density issue associated so with So I more. say no, okay. but no more rental property. Let's Very try well. to have homeowners. Have, excuse me, is there anything you have to add that hasn't already been stated. It sounds like there's a parking issue, that there's yes. a crime and drugs issue, yes. and that no no one who has testified thus far, with the exception of the appellant, is look is looking um, for this to happen. For all of the re you're looking for homeowners. Anything else? That's that's it. Thank okay. you so much for your time. We're, 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 we're done. Yeah. Thank we're you done. for your time. We're done. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. And sir, um, just real quickly, sure. how, um, what is the depth of the existing structure? Off the top of my head, I don't know. We submitted drawings along with the application that would say so. It was really, really small. I apologize. Is there a way I could follow up on that? I don't want to give you the incorrect information. I have it, I have it saved. Um, and, and the second point I wanted to make, and this is kind of to Mr. French, the, um, there was a reference to Section 18.412 in the zoning code. Um, that relates to multifamily structures that go vacant for a period of time, then they lose a dwelling unit. Um, this kind of a, uh, a question to my colleague. Um, section A goes through scope, and the very first um, part of that um, in A1 Roman I um, says, except as provided in a paragraph two, which doesn't apply here, this section applies to any structure that at any time with or without authorization by BMZA has been converted for four or more dwelling units. My question to Mr. French is would a building with three dwelling units, um, would that be under this provision or would this provision not apply since uh, the prior use was only at three dwelling units? And I'm not trying to put you on the smart, um, I'm on the spot, Martin. I'm uh, asking for a clarification for myself. Um, the provision certainly could have been worded more the clearly. Yeah. Um. The, the, reason, <laughs> the reason the planning department considers this provision cited applicable is uh, it states that this does not apply to any non-conforming structure, and it's the second part there. It has not been altered, added to, or subdivided in any way that increases the number of dwelling units to more than the maximum now allowed under this code. So the maximum now, on, now allowed under the code by the lot area requirements one. would be one unit. Uh, from a legal drafting perspective, I find it interesting that under the scope section, the very first thing it says is this applies to four more dwelling units. And then it goes under further detail um, with the loss of a dwelling unit. And I honestly don't have an opinion as to if that applies to this property or not, that for that would be for this board to decide if, if a three dwelling unit property, uh, a lawfully existing or at least lawfully used three dwelling unit property will qualify under this provision to lose a dwelling unit because of vacancy. Uh, the same variance standards would apply. Um, all those would remain the same. It would have to, property would have to be unique. It would have to be special. There would have to be reasons to grant a variance for anything above a single family dwelling unit given the lot area. But I just bring that to the board's attention. Do you have a copy of the executed contract? Um, of sale. Agreement? I printed, it's a 41 page document. I printed the first 10 or so. So, Are you um, willing to provide that for yes, consideration? Absolutely. You may keep that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think it would help the board. 
it would put the board's mind at ease, for instance, if after deliberation we were considering finding for you to see a signed contract. Yep. Yeah, I mean, uh, my question is, is that a copy or is that something you'd like to submit for our consideration? There, I didn't see anything signed. Oh. So I, I apologize. I, I didn't print the full 41 page contract, which at the very end would have the final signatures. This does have um, signature or initials of the buyer as we move through, but just I didn't want to print 41 pages. I could submit that and that is available. Okay. Well, if you, you, you're yeah, free to submit is, what you have. Please, I'd be happy to. Right. You'd be able, to, if we made a decision, I'm not saying the board was leaning this direction because I'm only speaking for myself, sure. to deliver, to hold this for deliberation, you'd be able to submit the contract and potentially photos of the renovation. I'd be glad to. And quick question, given all of the comments about the size, how size, how big is each individual unit? How many square feet is each unit? They're all quite large, approaching eight, 900 square feet each okay. with a very significant bedroom, living area, a uh, sizable kitchen with cabinetry on both sides and a full bath with a bath included. Uh, I, I just wanted to note, this is probably my last comment and let's go enjoy July 4th, uh, but is there's a parking pad in the rear of the unit that could fit two cars front to back. I understand that that would uh, not necessarily be the best situation, but uh, as long as you don't drive a truck, you can fit two cars off street behind the, the dwelling unit, uh, which could maybe be an arrangement for Mr. Juwan Harris, who will be the owner occupant if he's able to purchase this, where he could be parking there or uh, one of the other two tenants could be. The department would note for the record that the planning uh, department routinely has to remind people that the zoning code specifies a parking space is nine feet by 18 feet and this lot is only 14 feet wide. You do not have any possibility of providing more than one parking space meeting zoning code standards. Okay. Thank you. Right. Anything else, sir? No, that's it. I appreciate your time. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Actually, I one follow up. Yeah. I'm sorry. Um, so all the work permits were pulled for this, correct? Correct. Um, on those work permits, could would, would a reasonable person reading that permit application understand that you were uh, rehabbing a building for three dwelling units? I know that question is a bit subjective, but I, I'm, um, there's a reason why the permit process works the way it does to catch things before the work is done sure. and before sure. uh, a, sin a significant amount of money is spent on a project sure. for something like a use and occupancy permit that wouldn't be allowed. So anything you could offer uh, uh, about those work permits it would, would be helpful. Mostly, this is just my opinion, but it would mostly could be the uh, electrical permit mm -hmm. uh, because the, the building was disconnected from the, the bg &E mains. So you have to go through their new business process. They come in, they install their new smart meters. Um, and you have to clearly state on that permit. I mean, there's no messing around with that in any way. You have to say this is, I need three meters and a public service. Um, and that's a pretty clear indication, um, as well as the amperage that you need coming into the building for each unit. You have to give a load calculation. Uh, that was all given, and the indication that we would need three units, and or three meters along with a public service meter, which would be a clear indication of three units. Okay, thank you. Yep, you're welcome, thank you. Which case? Uh, 188. No. The bottom of the first page. Yeah. All right. Oh, I have a line to it. Why do I have that? Was it postponed? I thought I had postponed. I have it postponed. That was postponed. Okay. Yeah. I just missed that one. Yeah. Got it. Right. Calling the case 2019-207. 2229 through 2245 Kirk Avenue, 2247 Kirk Avenue, 2249 Kirk Avenue, 2251 Kirk Avenue, and portion of Alley. Merrill Hamilton. We have before us a request to consolidate subdivide lots used as art studio, art studio, industrial, art gallery, cultural facility, museum and library, offices, recreation, indoors, indoor and outdoor entertainment, live, and nine dwelling room, dwelling rooming units. Is that, did I say that accurately? That's correct, except uh, it's, it's actually eight, not nine, yeah. Okay. You uh, swear the witnesses, please.
I do. Okay. Do we have any staff reports? Yes. First, we have two letters, one from the Greater Greenmount Community Association and one from Project Jubilee. They basically offer their support. Uh, let's see. Since its inception in 2010, the compound has filled an important role in East Baltimore Midway, clearing blight, providing public programming, affordable housing for artists, greening, and engagement with neighborhood youth. Uh, with live entertainment, the compound can continue to serve as home for engaging public programming, including lectures, workshops, and music events. Since the compound has operated informally in this manner up to this point, it is clear from past experience that these activities will not be a disturbance to the community. On the contrary, given the absence of cultural spaces in the Midway neighborhood, it will be it will offer much needed home for the neighborhood's community activities. And that's from Project Jubilee and Greater Greenmount Community Association. Planning Department reviewed this application and noted a specific discrepancy which it would certainly request in the course of speaking to the board, the applicant would clarify. There is in the proposal for live entertainment, which is approvable in the opinion of the department, a statement that the fire rated capacity of the premises is 168 persons. However, the preliminary site plan included with this application states the capacity is 252 persons. Uh, after allowance for the rooming units and the art studios as described above, there may be residual off street parking space availability, which would need to be confirmed by the applicant. And possibly there might need to be a parking variance in association with this. Subject to those comments, the department recommends approval of this application subject to these conditions in addition to conditions which the board might establish. A copy of the use and occupancy permit for the premises must be kept on the premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. A copy of the written approval by the board of the live entertainment provided on the premises, including details of any restrictions or limitations on the live entertainment provided, must be kept on the premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. And a copy of all other permits and licenses required pursuant to the written approval of the board must be kept on the premises and available for inspection by representatives of Baltimore City at all times. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, Ms. Hamilton, having heard from the planning department uh, and the conditions stated, are those conditions acceptable to your client? Uh, I believe so, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tell us about your project. Uh, so the compound uh, was an abandoned forklift factory that was purchased by my colleague Nick and some other artists um, back in 2010. It had been vacant for about um, six years prior to that. And they started renovating it basically using sweat equity and their own investment, um, turning it into a communal living space, artist studios, and eventually sort of the extent that you read in the description there, which is um, we have uh, office space there. We have a couple of nonprofits that use it for community gatherings. We have an urban garden. Um, we have had some... Um, events there for the public, like workshops, lectures, um, educational programming, um, and also um, music events and things of that nature. So it's essentially a, a multidisciplinary art space. And um, we actually were involved in advocating along with the Mayor's Safe Art Space Task Force for the conditional use for the rooming units. Um, previously, the limit, I believe, was four unrelated people sharing a space. And so we actually um, participated in advocating for this condition to be passed. So now we're applying to uh, have that use ourselves. Um, and as far as the live entertainment portion goes, uh, we are looking to essentially continue in a permanent manner um, hosting events at the space that would welcome the public, provide entertainment for people in the neighborhood and create a, a vibrant community space in Midway, which doesn't currently have anything of that nature. Uh, uh, Mr. French mentioned the issue of uh, some differences in numbers of the, the yes. fire rate capacity. Yep. Yeah. Uh, what is the actual <coughs> capacity of the 
I, I believe the discrepancy there is that the 168 is referring to the spaces that are designated for live entertainment. You can see on the plans that we submitted with the application that there are two areas within the overall complex uh, that are designated for live entertainment and that I believe that additional, the 252 number is the capacity for the entire complex. I think that that is the discrepancy, if that makes sense. Clear the live entertainment would only be Friday and Saturday from Correct. 7 to 2 a.m. Correct. And it's not. Um, it would never be outside. It would only be inside. Uh, yes. Uh, what? It would never be out. <laughs> it's only inside. Correct. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Chairman, the part of the confusion with that is under the old code, um, square footage was used as the calculator mm -hmm. for. Um, the number of persons you could have in a, like a live event space or a restaurant space under the current code, it goes under fire rated capacity. My understanding from the fire department is that they will only do fire rated capacity of a building, not spaces within a building. So oftentimes the fire rated capacity would be a much higher number because they would consider every single floor of a building and all the spaces in every bathroom, every storage closet. Um, so my understanding from, the, from what was submitted is that there is a request for a certain number of people, 168, for this particular space, but with the, 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 the fire rated capacity is higher than that because it would be taking into account the entire um, um, existing structure. Thank you. Mm. Uh, anything else you'd like to add? Um, I'm not sure. Do either of you feel like adding anything that we haven't covered? Well, I'd like Oh, what I'm sorry. Um, I mean, the only other piece that was brought up in the comments from planning, I think, mentioned the parking, potential need for parking variance. And um, I just wanted to mention that, uh, you know, prior to, we've essentially been working over the last couple of years with the Mayor's Safe Art Space Task Force to bring this building up to code. Um, we've raised about $760,000 to do that work. Um, and we're underway. I mean, we've completed, I would say, 65% of the project uh, at this point, and we're moving toward completion. Um, so our hope would be, once that work is done, to again be able to have events at the space. Um, in the past, we have not had any issues with um, an over overwhelming need for parking. There's ample parking both on Kirk Avenue and Curtin, which are light industrial streets that don't typically have people parking on them for residential use and also don't have people there in the evening. So um, we're it's sort of our feeling that that is sufficient for what's required with the live entertainment use. Okay. Any questions from the board? No. 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 Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, finally, call on the case of 2019 208 5808 Bel Air Road, Lionel Burnett. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Lionel Burnett, and I'm here to ask the board permission to grant me uh, the permission to operate a MVA certified driving school at 508 Bel Air Road, which um, the planning has classified as a C1 zone area. All right, so we have here to use first floor as a driving school. Could you swear the witnesses, please? Raise your right hand. Swear or affirm testimony to your representation in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. sir. And do we have any staff report? Yes. Planning department reviewed this application, noted this property is in the C1 zoning district. The C1 zoning district does not permit educational facilities classified as commercial vocational, uh, either as a permitted or a conditional use, and therefore they are prohibited in that district. The specific issue is that the zoning code definition of educational facility, commercial vocational, includes as part of its definition, quotes, means a school conducted as a commercial enterprise such as a driving school, end quotes. That's subsection 1-305X of the zoning code. The Department of Planning therefore recommends disapproval of this application if the board determines that the proposed use is a type of educational facility, commercial vocational, 
which is a prohibited use in the C1 zoning district where this property is located. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. French. Uh, Mr. Burnett? Yes, sir. Uh, what say you? Uh, we, we <laughs> it seems that the code specifically prohibits the use that you're seeking to have uh, in the zoning. Yes, I noticed that, sir. I also noticed that this type of um, school is not a uh, regular school. It won't operate during regular hours. It's a post uh, secondary hours, which would be from 6 to 9 p.m. So it would not affect the general, you know, um, secondary school hours. I don't think that's a condition of or part of the definition of a vocational school. See, here, what's perhaps unique about the specific use that you're requesting, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no dispute, a driving school, you're going to teach people to drive, mm -hmm. right? Yes, sir. You'll have education, you'll have a classroom component. Imagine you'll be taking them out on the road, they'll come back and they'll take tests, things like that. A, a traditional driving school, right? Yes, sir. Um, unfortunately, the code speaks to a traditional driving school as being that uh, educational facility that is strictly prohibited in that zoning district. Now, it doesn't speak to, it doesn't become non-prohibited or allowed because you do it after hours. In fact, my experience is many driving schools and most driving schools do after hours to accommodate young teenage drivers who mm -hmm. are new, <laughs> new after school and things like that. So I don't think that's a, a component of uh, why it is prohibited the yeah. hours under which it would be operated. Yes, sir. I also, um, when I first came up with this idea to do this driving school, yes, there's a driving school at 3224 Bellier Road on the same road, which I think it's classified as the same C1 area, which been operating for years. So I never knew that until today I was given this paper, I never knew that that would be the cause for me, you know, not to be granted a school, so. Well, to the extent the, the, factually, uh -huh. the zoning code was amended and overhauled <coughs> last year, <coughs> the year before, I don't know, it was 2018 or two years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so lots has changed, I don't know if uh, that particular component is, is one of those things, uh, but certainly that school that's been operating for years, certainly we know operate under a different zoning code. Mm. Uh, uh, but in 2019, for the date of your application, uh, unfortunately, unless there's something you can tell me that's different that takes your drive, proposed driving school outside of what the, co the zoning code deems to be a driving school, which I think is the same thing, um, it would appear that uh, the board's not authorized to grant that appeal uh, or that your relief uh, because it's prohibited. The zoning code strictly prohibits exactly what it is you want to do. Okay. Hmm. Anything else you'd like to add, sir? No, sir. Just, uh, I mean, if it's prohibited, then it would not be granted. So <laughs> I guess I could say a million things, like I spoke to the neighbors, and they encourage the fact that they got to send their kids away to a driving school while, you know, the immediate community don't have one. So, you know, I guess uh, me saying that would mean. So mean the, um, the Baltimore City Council writes the zoning code. Okay. Um, so to take a use that is prohibited and makes it allowed would require um, the law to be changed essentially so you could certainly reach out to your city council person and say I want this you know I, I have this business proposal but the code just prohibits it um, and then it would be to the city council to say you know, maybe we should allow driving schools in C ones um, unfortunately this board just doesn't have that authority mm. um, much to the chagrin of certain staff members um, but uh, unfortunately that's the only way to to um, kind of get what you want for this particular business is to change the law. Okay. Uh, and you're certainly welcome to go down that avenue um, with with your with your uh, city council person. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, thank you all. all right, I tried. <laughs> okay, have a good day. All right. Off the record? That's a wrap.